This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena, straight out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, here on Canada Day 2022. But, and we I love my country, but a week from today, I turn 50. And I thought, you know, the week leading up to my birthday, you know, I thought I would uh, celebrate a little bit because, you know, you only turn 50 once, you know, and I have somebody, I, I thought I would do something different this time that I've never done before. I have somebody that's been on my show that's done numerous tribute interviews, uh, tributes on Lucille Ball, Steve Allen, um, uh, Don Wells, um, Ella Fitzgerald, Mary Tyler Moore. Is there another one in there? I don't remember. Uh, there might be. It, it, I've had this guy and he's been on. Uh, oh, Milton Berle. There you go. Six, six tributes. This guy knows a lot of people and uh, he's well respected. And I thought, and I've had him on two or three times just talking about his own career in life. And I thought, you know, for my 50th, I thought it'd be a great idea to have him interview me. Not that I'm important. It's just, I was like, I'm doing a podcast here. I was like, why not do something interesting for my 50th a week from today? And I thought, my guest, Mr. Jeffrey Mark, the best guy for the job. Welcome, Jeffrey. I hand the reels over to you. You look great. I love the glitterly blue hat and the, the blue oak. That, that looks great. Thank you, sir. Well, let's get this thing started. Absolutely. First of all, we got to kick this off with this. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Greg. <coughs> I'm singing to him and he's not even looking at me. I Happy am. I'm trying to get my partner. Happy Yay, Greg. Yay, pussy cat. Skittles was grabbing old claw in the blankets back there. I was like, Skittles, he's singing happy birthday to me. You're supposed to join me. He says, I was Never asleep. work with children and animals. They Kitty, always you upstage you. You hear that, Kitty. You hear that. Skittles is like, you're exploiting me. You're exploiting me. <laughs> he didn't like that. Are you done petting your pussy? <laughs> I am. I am. I am. <laughs> My first thought about this, I only know two people in Newfoundland. You and a, a young actor friend of mine, Brian. Um, but I'm not from Newfoundland. Where, you, where are you right now? New Brunswick. So for us Americans who don't know Canadian geography very well, how far is New Brunswick from Newfoundland? I don't know. <laughs> Close enough. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know either? Oh, smell nope. the blind leading. And you're Canadian. Wonderful, uh -huh. wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I know New Brunswick, New Jersey very well. But do you think there is something that is endemic to being Canadian and East, the Eastern half of the, of the country. So much talent comes out of Eastern Canada, um, English speaking, French speaking, so many comedians, so many actors, so many people who do what we do, interviewers, writers. Is, is it that Americans notice you more because you're not from here? Or do you think there's something about being Canadian that's got a different vibe than being uh, someone who lives in the U.S.? Well, let me put it out to you like this, A. Eh? <laughs> eh? Of You know what? Um, 
In terms of talent, I never, when I was young, really noticed Canadian talent. It wasn't until I got older where I was like, gee, we got a lot of amazing people that uh, are from here. And then they go to the U.S. and uh, they expand it. But I know that um, not a lot of people know where we are here in New Brunswick. I'm just waiting for somebody from here <laughs> to, to put us on the map. We're like well, parts maybe, unknown. We're like maybe, parts unknown. Maybe, maybe it's going to be you. Well, I always said that the ultimate warrior who was built from parts unknown, he must have been from here. He must have been. It's the only place I could think of it's called parts unknown. <laughs> I've had guests come on here and they say, there's a there's a, a, a time zone ahead of Florida. Yeah, us. <laughs> and then the one I mentioned, Newfoundland, which I did not know this till recently, they're an extra half hour. They're in their own time zone so that there's the difference between where you and i are you know mm -hmm. so the, there's eastern time then there's atlantic time and then there's new Bra there's newfoundland time because it's I, I it's the only place on the planet that has an extra half hour built into their times which must drive everybody there crazy but i didn't do it well, Newfoundland, they also got all the uh, Newfie jokes that I grew up with. <laughs> yeah, let's, 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 let's not do that. <laughs> I grew up with so many of them and only remember a couple. Good, good, because they're probably not. Th this is a good show. We want to keep it that way. Good hearted. You've done so many episodes of this show through the years. Enough so that my publicist books people with you. That's how I came to you. Harlan Bowl, mm -hmm. my publicist, hooked us up. And then we've been, we enjoy this so much. I've just done all these shows with you. But nobody, including myself, becomes an interviewer on a show like this. You don't just get out of bed one day and start talking. Who influenced you? What, what did you observe that you said, ooh, I can do that? You know what? This it's that's a good question because uh, they're all going to be good questions, Greg. That's why you have me here. That's why I have you because you're the best. Correct. Yes, Answer folks. The, the people I mentioned earlier, folks, he's interviewed them all. So I'm being interviewed by the best here. But I'll tell you, I've been re I've re been reviewing movies since 1996. And originally I wanted to do something in writing, you know, but I would always rip off the movies I'd seen. So I started reviewing movies and in 2005, my friend Colin, my best friend here, uh, asked me if I ever considered going to CHSR, which is the radio station on campus. And cause they, they don't do the traditional radio. They have various shows with various talents and various topics, you know, they didn't have a film critic when I called them. So I went down them, showed them my portfolio and uh, got trained and was doing that for 10 years. It was just me going on there, reading film reviews and playing music. And uh, it was a, an, uh, an ex colleague of mine who ended up with the interview with Tommy Wiseau. And he did not have, like, my impression is he, you'd go talk to him on the phone. Let's do it on the radio where we can record it. And uh, Tommy Wiseau was famous for that low budget, worst film of all time, The Room. And, and uh, of course, Dave, uh, James Franco played him in The Disaster Artist and Tommy Wiseau was quite an interesting first guest. Because I, I remember when it was being set up, my I could see my program director and they through the glass in Studio A just kind of looking in at us with this, who the heck are you guys talking to look on his face? But after Tommy Wiseau, it was like, uh, who else can I do this with? You know? And my mind went back to my uncle who had a video store 
from 1981 to 1988. And I just kept thinking about all the females I had crushes on growing up. And I was immediately, what I, what I did was like, wonder if any of the girls uh, in these movies would talk to me. And, um, and uh, the first two I went after were Adrienne King from Friday the 13th and Lisa Langlois from Class of 1984. Adrian, I went after that long weekend in May and because um, I interviewed Tommy Wiseau in February, or not February, April that year, 2015. And uh, I went after Adrian in the long weekend in May and I, and I remember getting a response from her and I just, I was at my brother's apartment and I kind of leaned back on the chair. Like she said, yes, it was so surreal. Cause had it been Tommy Wiseau one and done, I would have been fine. I had no idea. And Adrian said, yes. And Lisa Langwa eventually got back to me and her manager set everything up. And it's interestingly enough because Lisa Langwa has become not only one of my best friends right now, but she has become a real mentor and got me out of New Brunswick to my first con in Toronto because I've never flown before that. And she and I have remained in touch. In fact, I heard from her yesterday as I was there leaving work. Yeah. I believe, however, lovely stories. Mm -hmm. but the question was, who influenced you? That's right. I'm sorry. Um, you know what? In terms of influence, and you might not see this because I'm not as daring as this guy, but I'm a huge Howard Stern fan. And um, so I love, yeah, he is my influence, but there's no way I can be Howard Stern. I can only be me, but I certainly admire his uh, long career. And um, when I do listen to him, I pick up this and that, you know. But um, Howard Stern, I think, is a big influence for me. Well, you know, Howard, we who lived in New York, because I used to live in New York, I was born and raised there, uh, saw Howard locally. Mm -hmm. uh, he eventually got, a, was it, I, I'm trying to remember, it, was a, it wasn't cable. I guess it was a access show or a local Channel 9 in New York show once a week. And he tried his best within the limits of what the FCC back then would allow back when the FCC had to say about anything. Mm -hmm. um, he brought on Arlene Francis and Kitty Carlisle. Mm -hmm. And he played this, uh, what's the secret game? Because Miss Carlisle had been the doyen of to tell the truth, Miss Francis of what's my line for many, many, for decades. And, you know, the secret was that she was a lesbian and she was this, this girl in a, a bikini. And the two ladies asked intelligent questions. They couldn't figure what he was getting at. And he was like, guess what, you old broads? She's a lesbian. And Kitty Carlisle looked at Arlene Francis and looked back at him and said, Mr. Stern, Miss Francis and I have been in show business together a hundred years. Don't you think we've met a lesbian before? And you just watched all the blood drain out of his face. He had to work at, you know, that shock jock thing, how to do it without offending too many of his listeners. It, it was, a, it, he did not come out of the womb like that. And, and personally, he's nothing like that. He's, he's, a, he's a, a nice Jewish boy whose wife tells him what to do off mic, but he found this character to play and it, it works for him. Do you think that the Greg Gilbert who's on your show, is he very different from Greg Gilbert who's, when, when the lights, by the way, get better lights. When the lights are on and the cameras, you know, the microphone is on, are you very different or are, are you the same guy in both places? Pretty much the same guy, but I am going to say there is differences though. Um, like when I hang out with Lisa Langwa in Toronto, I, I try my best to watch my language. Uh, not that she's offended by it. It's just, I try to be proper as I can, you know, 
when I'm at the hospital working, I watch what I say, you know, because you got patients and doctors and nurses around, you know, but I'm going to tell you, it's interesting you say that because um, my family sees me one way, you know, like you just saw Skittles here. My brother and sister-in-law, I drive them up the wall talking about Skittles all the time. Like Skittles is like my best friend, you know, like I bring Skittles up and everything. I'll go to work and I'll say, I'm working today because Skittles wouldn't take the shift. And people at work laugh because they know what I'm talking about. Here's the thing. When I first went to Toronto and it was just me and I came back, nobody in my family knew what side, like they saw one side of me, the goofy side. None of them had seen what I'm like at the cons. Because without my brother and sister-in-law and whatnot, I can be immature. I could definitely be that way around my cat. When I go to the cons, I try to work it. I have to put on an image, you know? And you got to know how to present yourself. And Lisa taught me a lot of that. Told me about getting business cards and... Uh, and stuff like this. I learned a lot through her, I'll tell you. And um, so, yeah, there, there probably is a side of me you don't see. Not a big difference. It's not like I'm putting on a character, but like I, I'm going to do two cons this fall. So when I go through those doors, I'm probably going to be presenting myself a little different than what I would be if I'm, you know, chumming with friends somewhere, you know? You're mentioning going to cons uh, for our viewers' edification. Mm -hmm. I think we all know what a con is, but what is it that you do at them when you go? The conventions, yes. I'm going to tell you, I remember that first one. What do you do there is the question. What do I do there? Well, for me, I meet a lot of the guests that I financially, I try to keep myself financially in check, of course. Not only do I meet the guest and I you know, buy a photo or take a picture with them or whatnot, I always present my business cards and uh, sell my show because I want to see if I can get some of them interested to come on my show. So I do a lot of that and I've had some success. Actually, it's interesting because I've had two individuals that actually gave me their phone numbers at these cons, you know, and uh, which I usually will get a business card. Vernon Wells gave me a business card, but it's unusual to get a phone number, you know, because that, that's very personal, but, but it's also trusting. And uh, I try to make that connection so that I want to become one of these people when they see me at a con, it's like, okay, we know who, what he's all about. And, uh, and if you treat the guest well, they'll want to come back, like yourself. And, of course, I like to look at the merchandise and if there's people, the vendors, like my friends from the band Blood Opera. I, they've been to every one of them I've been to, and I always stop in to see them and hang out with them, you know, because they're great guys. I mean, you get me coming back time after time because I enjoy talking with you. Mm-hmm. And for the folks who are watching who don't get to see this, at the end of the show, he takes off his shirt and flexes his muscles for me. I keep coming back. <laughs> I'm waiting for my laugh. Hang on one second. I can time the laugh. People at home are still laughing. Oh, okay, they just stopped laughing. Very good. Do you have, take me out of the equation. Has there been one favorite guest so far? You know what? Lisa is my favorite guest. She really took a, a chance on me, you know? Lisa Langwa, she was in the movie Class of 1984, which has had Roddy McDowell in it and early film. Roddy? Yeah, and early film for Michael J. Fox. She was in Happy Birthday to Me. She worked with John Houston in Phobia. Um, Lisa, I, I got to say, is up there as my number one because, you know, she didn't have to say, come to Toronto and assist me at my table. Right. But it wasn't just that. We connected 
we had dinner and she showed me Toronto. I know how to uh, do the subways and the streetcars now because of her, because we don't have those here. She trained me well, you know? So I remember there was one year I went there for a comic con and I almost didn't go because she was, she was going to be in Los Angeles, but she told me, she said, go, go. Uh, comic con's different from the horror film cons you know, increase your brand. That was her words. Increase your brand. That's but, a good sentence. Yeah. But I know that uh, what else she was doing too. Cause she called me that, that weekend. What else did she do? She called me that weekend and she asked how I was making out without her there. And I said, you know what? You taught me well. The, I know these sub, I know where I'm going. And uh, I know where I'm supposed to go. I know the the uh, housing place I'm supposed to go to to stay at. I was like, you taught me well. All right. And so now the obverse of the question, and there's a moratorium on Lisa Langlois stories for the rest of this hour. We gave her lots of good publicity. She's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful actor. I want to talk about you, not her. Obverse side of the coin. Did you ever get somebody on here again besides me that you went, oh, I'm never going to have this motherfucker on again. I am never going to deal with this person again. This is awful. They're not answering my questions. They're being unresponsive or they're drunk or they're stoned or, or they're just not a nice person. And I know I just cursed and I shouldn't have it. I'm sorry. That's OK. That's OK. Jeepers. I get lots of people on here to curse. Sometimes I do it. But to answer the question, did you ever have one guest that you just went, no, no. No mas. You know what? I had a guest back in January that I'll probably not have back. Um, he was in uh, the really horrible 2006 remake of Black Christmas. And uh, he's a Canadian actor. And um, the interview was going really well up until a point. And then I asked a question that um, I've asked people before and I meant nothing by it, but he was involved in Scooby-Doo Monsters Unleashed. And I said to him, I said, I said, is Sarah Michelle Gellar as beautiful in person as she appears on screen? And he took offense to that. Saying, on her I, behalf or his behalf? His behalf, you know, I never heard from her, but. But I never met anything pervy by it. She's lovely. But I, but he got right offended and said, well, you never said that to me or blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah. And I had to find a way to uh, redirect the interview and get it back on track. And then it went off track again because I made the mistake of asking him what the pandemic was like where he was. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, he got talking about that and he said he had his uh, two shots and a booster. I said, well, I have my two shots. I haven't had a booster. I haven't been asked. And he started accusing me of affecting everybody around me and you're killing your blah, blah, blah. I don't remember the exact words. And it was like, oh, my goodness, get me out of here. You know, um, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a pleasant experience for him. It was not a pleasant experience for me. I know if I was in his shoes, I would have handled it differently. Uh, but that one was uh, definitely not a, a pleasant interview to do, but I'm still going to put it up. Uh, he said I could edit that out. I said, I don't know how to edit it. And quite frankly, I'm not going to really. No, if he's been a jerk, let the world see it. Yeah, but I meant nothing by Sarah Michelle Geller. No, I, I did. I didn't, Greg, I Greg, didn't say anything Greg, about innocent, her body. Innocent question. He overreacted and he was looking for a fight. And maybe he thought if he was being controversial or confrontational with you, it would be a better interview, which is never really works. I've, I've only, I, I'm trying to remember my own career. So I've been mm -hmm. doing this, as you know, a very long time. Yep. I've had people interview me who it was obvious they had no idea who I really was. They had not read the book or listened to the CD or watched the movie or whatever I was selling that week. Mm -hmm. uh, I was filling time for them and they were, they were not attached. 
uh, what I do with that is what Milton Berle taught me to do, which is just take over, push them out of the way and give the people who are watching a show because that's what they're tuning in for. The, uh, the converse of that was the only time I was interviewed where I was like, I will never speak to that person again. I was in Chicago in the mid 1990s and I was on an NPR station and I mentioned this because it has to do with the story. The host was African-American mm -hmm. and he filled an hour with me and the Dalai Lama's brother. Now, originally it was supposed to be me and the Dalai Lama, which I was thrilled for. Ooh, an hour to sit, just, just I want to soak up all the wisdom. Dalai Lama got ill, sent his brother on the tour, and this African-American host spent an hour skewering me. How dare I ever write about African-Americans? Who do I think I am to write about African-Americans? And skewering with Dalai Lama's brother, why should I even talk to you? You didn't write this, his book. You're not called Dalai Lama. Why, why are you even here? An hour of asking us questions, cutting us off, and jabbing us. Wow. And, and as we walked out of the studio, I turned to the Dalai Lama's brother and I said, how much can we raise to get him killed? And, and he laughed. I was diffusing a bad moment with the Dalai Lama. I, I, I meant no disrespect in reality, just, boy, that was awful. And mm -hmm. I made the Dalai Lama's brother laugh, but that's the only time it was awful for me. But I've seen other people crash and burn in interviews. And they're like, oh, that's not good at all. No. Yeah. Who would you like to interview who's around today? And then we'll, we'll go to, no, let, let's I'll take that back. Who is no longer with us? You would have loved to have interviewed. I would have melted and I would have been full, full of goosebumps, but Grace Kelly. Oh, you got good taste. Oh, gee. <laughs> I would be like Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> what was it about Grace Kelly? Now, you're, you're talking about as a fan and maybe as a man, how much she appealed to you. But what would you have wanted to talk to her about? You know what? I wouldn't talk to her about being a princess. I'd talk to her about working with uh, Alfred Hitchcock and... Uh, uh, three great movies. I love Rear Window and I love to catch a thief. And I can understand why, not just from a physical standpoint, but why she was Hitchcock's favorite actress to use. You know, I get it, you know. But if it wasn't her, it would be Alfred Hitchcock. But Grace Kelly, I definitely have a soft spot for her. But, but I could talk to her just about you know how she got her like she came from a rich uh, background i believe oh and she, good heavens but yet she was not afraid to work you know and uh she did the hitchcock movie she did high society which was a musical which was a step, stepping into uncharted territory for her and she did country girl she did country girl yeah which is she very won unsympathetic yeah so i like grace kelly but you know what? It's just, um, you mentioned for somebody who's passed away, but I could say the same thing about who I'd love to interview who's living. That was my next question. Don't, don't. Okay. We'll get here. to that in a minute, but Grace Kelly, there was something very, um, she kind of struck me. This is going to sound so cheesy, but she struck me as like, you know, you're on a hot day. And, and she's like that breeze that comes through the window and shifts the curtains. That is Grace Kelly, you know? There you go. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I can watch Grace Kelly and not just look at her and lust or so to speak, you know? Uh, there, there is a talk show host in Cleveland who feels the same way about Suzanne Plachette. When he found mm -hmm. out that Susie and I were friends, he's like, 
what can you tell me about her? He's just obsessed with her. Mm -hmm. And for good reason. She was a wonderful woman. Yeah. Uh, now, you knew that Grace Kelly's cousin was Dina Merrill, right? No, I didn't. Wow. Next time you see Dina Merrill with the blonde hair and the same angelic face and the same kind of accent, it's because they were cousins. Okay. Okay. I, I, um, when I think of Grace Kelly, I think about the, I stay, I, I don't pay much attention to, because, you know, Prince Rainier kind of took her away from that. Even Hitchcock wanted to get her back into another movie. I think it was Marnie he wanted to get her in and she wasn't able to. And I was like, oh man, you know, but I don't, I don't pay much attention. I was hoping to get somebody somebody in relation to her to come on here and talk about her but that's probably going to be a hard hole is shovel deep enough to do but but um talk about her people who knew her personally or people who knew about yeah her yeah personally and her career you know but yeah definitely personally but the thing is it's i'm not a dirt digger you know like i had audrey hepburn's eldest son on here and he enjoyed it. You know, I never disrespected her. You know, I don't ask questions. I had Hitchcock's granddaughter on here, you know, and, and had a great time. So, you know, it's, it's a funny thing asking about people's personal, personal mm -hmm. lives. Everybody's got a story of some kind. Mm -hmm. No marriage is without its hardships. No parent child relationship is without <laughs> we'll talk about my kids sometime uh, without its bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Grace Kelly's case, well, first of all, everybody who knew her is gone, uh, who, who really spent time with her is, is gone because she was out of Hollywood by the late fifties, but, you know, even early in her, in her, in her marriage, she visited a couple of times, but pretty much after that, it was, hands off if you wanted to see her you had to go to monaco yeah which is how they pronounce it by the way monaco um but i think if you pressed for details it's, it's the same thing uh, people ask me all the time about lucille ball's private life and i don't discuss her private life i'll give public. you an example here's what i'm talking about um when i interviewed hitchcock's granddaughter one of the things that come up that I thought, now this, this will be fun, personal stuff. She talked about uh, Hitchcock getting his first beta machine and how frustrated he was trying to get that to work. Stuff like that, not everybody knows about, but right. it's something harmless, you know? Well, yeah, and I, we I had, agree with you. Yeah. I, 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 the, the end of my sentence was going to be that they asked me about Lucille Ball's personal life. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I say, A, why do you need to know this? And then if they pressed, my answer is go out. You may have heard me say this to you before on the air. Go out in your neighborhood, knock on any door, inject them with a truth serum, ask them about their personal lives. And you're going to get the same kinds of answers with famous people. Maybe the names will be more famous that they're talking about, but some it's the president as opposed to their boss, mm -hmm. or it's some very, very famous person versus someone you've never heard of, but the interactions and the emotions and the nonsense and some of the bad behavior, it's the same because we're people mm -hmm. and, and that personal, personal stuff, it really isn't all that interesting. I bet it isn't. I bet it isn't. All right. So we're moving from who was to who is. Who's around today that you, and, and let's bifurcate this. I don't mean who do you have a crush on you want to just gawk at. Who is working that you'd really like to interview? Like, do you think they have an interesting story? Emma Stone. Why? Well, the first part that you said, I did have a crush on her, but here's the thing with Emma. There are several things about Emma Stone that are interesting, and some of these things I found out just recently. Apparently, before becoming an actor, she wanted to do work on web pages. I've read that several places. 
and I know nothing about doing that stuff. So it tells me she's got a little background in electronics. I love the fact that when she does interviews, she's not shy away from, uh, like she gives credit to her family. Like I know what her brother's name was and I never even looked him up, you know? And uh, he's not a famous person, but Emma transforms so well. I um, first saw her in Superbad, loved her in that. And I could relate to that film. And I think that was where the appeal started because I know what it's like to, uh, to like somebody and not being able to communicate with them the way Jonah Hill tried to communicate with her and all the stuff he did to try to appeal to her. And that might've been the launching pad, but I remember when she got her first starring role in Easy A, I was like, okay, it's about time somebody took notice. But she went from that, she's in Zombieland, which is a horror comedy. She's in La La Land, a musical. She was in um, The Favorite, a drama, a period drama. She's in uh, Cruella. No, you don't have to list all the different films. But I'll, I give you, she's a wonderful actress. She's a wonderful she really actress. Is. But here's another thing she does that I totally respect. She keeps her life private. She, um, it wasn't until a paparazzi caught her just out filling her gas tank one day. There was no announcement that she was pregnant. When she got married, it was done privately. There was not a bunch of, oh, we're getting married, a front page like some people do. I respect that. Plus, I'm very, I'm very lucky someone you know, Harlan Bull, my, my publicist, doesn't do that. He won't. He doesn't publicize the person. He publicizes the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I would say to Harlan, hey, uh, some crazy thing happened to me. Let's, let's, let's get some, he'll say, no, I won't do that. Uh, he, he, he has us, those of us, and he's got a lot of people he works for. It's about the work. It's about your good works. If they're, if I'm doing charity or something, he'll publicize that. But if I were to say to him, Oh, I'm dating a celebrity or uh, I slept with a celebrity or this weird thing, he, he, no, 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 no. So I, I agree with you. I respect people who don't do the Kardashian thing. Where Emma strikes me as somebody that would be just cool just to just have a normal conversation with. It's, it's uh, just somebody just like, um, interesting to talk to but somebody who's quirky funny she, even watching her interviewed she comes off as somebody i want to watch she's not boring i'm going to tell you especially with an attractive actress if they can make me want to watch watch them more than what i physically see they've done their job okay let's let's move this to something else because i want to see if the answers will be different okay so fanboy who likes pretty girls who are quirky, mm -hmm. who are the men you would like to talk to? Oh my goodness. Um, Ladies and gay boys, I got you covered here. Let's, let's talk about some men. Well, if you want to go back to the past. Sure. Alfred Hitchcock, I always loved. But I mean, James Stewart and Cary Grant, who are in both in four of his movies, I love both of them, you know? In fact, I think Cary Grant, I see a lot of Cary Grant and George Clooney. A lot of it. I do too. I yep. do too. And that's not and, a bad and yet, thing. And yet, James Stewart and Cary Grant were terrible interviewees. They didn't like being interviewed. Mm -hmm. They absolutely refused to discuss their private lives in any fashion they would only the only 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 and set 10 more onlys after that discuss the latest movie or the latest project when they came on television or they had a funny story or a funny story written 
for them to share because you were not going to find out who they were from being on Johnny Carson or Merv Griffin or Mike Douglas or Barbara Walters or whomever else was doing the asking. Mm -hmm. they, they, just, they just, no, they refused. So it would have been a very hard road for you to hoe. You could have gotten them if they were alive, but what do you ask, you know? I'd ask about their movies. Jeepers, you, like I, I could just talk about the four Hitchcock movies that they did, and that would fill all my time right there, you know? You like, could write a book. But in terms of actors today, good question. John Travolta had a tremendous influence on me in terms of my makeover I gave myself years ago from Saturday Night Fever. So I like John. But you know what? And this might be a controversial answer because so many people, there are people that don't like this guy and there's people that do. I personally do. Tom Cruise. He's been in so many movies I like. So many movies. And um, the Scientology thing, you know, I could, I, I could care less. I have my beliefs. He has his. But I would want to talk about the work. The guy's doing going doing uh, extraordinary stunt work, which is stuff he doesn't have to do too. He like he pushes himself further. But he's done movies a, a lot of people don't have high in the radar that I, I love Rock of Ages, for example. I thought he was great in that, you know. Plus the music took me way back. But there's actors like that that I really like, you know, and um so you mentioned you had a sentence right there, mm -hmm. pushing, pushing yourself. So you're having a birthday. He's having a birthday. And what do you want for yourself? Like, what's your five year plan? Uh, are, are you satisfied with being a talk show host? Is there something I won't say more because more makes it sound like you're not doing enough. And I, I don't mean that at all. Mm -hmm. But is there something different you want to do? You know what? I've thought about that a lot. I've lived here my 50 years. But when Lisa introduced me to Toronto, I fell in love with it. Um, I'm, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I'm either going to do a housing thing with my brother and sister-in-law, where they live upstairs and I live downstairs, and I do my work at the hospital, and I still do my show because I'm happy with this. I seriously am happy with this. The other thing that's definitely in the back of my mind is moving to Toronto. Because, man, of course, Toronto is an expensive city to live in. But, you know, if I weren't in the hospital down there, I'd be making some good money, too. And, and forgive me for not knowing better uh, as a stupid member of the united states i won't call myself american right now but as a member of the united states um isn't toronto kind of like new york or hollywood as far as canadian show business is concerned yeah i'd go with that yeah but for me here's something i've been into toronto I've been to toronto every year since 2017 except for 2020 of course but we'll get into that but it's like every stop on the subway i could get off and explore something different that's what you know, big cities have to offer. I love that. I mean, Lisa and I, when we're going to uh, Frightmare in the Falls, we got off one place because she was checking out uh, a T-shirt place she found online because she wanted to get T-shirts done. And I went there and did that and got a T-shirt made with her image on it and uh, from class of 1984. But it was like, I just kept looking around. It's like, there's so much. Like here, I've seen everything pretty much. It's a small city. Toronto, there's so much, and plus the culture there. Like, I saw my first IMAX. I saw Apocalypse Now on IMAX. You know, we don't have an IMAX theater right here. Halifax, I think, has one, but but I can see older movies, special screenings, and I'll tell you, it's fun to go to an older movie at a theater with that audience and listen to them react to it. A lot of fun. I like have, stuff like that. Have you any desire to be an actor yourself? No. 
Although I do appear in nine James Vilsalmo movies, but I don't call those acting pieces. <laughs> but uh, James is a pretty funny guy, you know, and he brings in all these people from the cons to make appearances in his movies. So I'm in good, I'm in good company, you know. Eric Roberts is watching me twice on television and it wants blood. I don't care how bad my performance is. I'm being watched by Eric Roberts. I'm in good company. What you, you have a fan base because mm -hmm. people are watching these shows. I, I hear back from people who have seen me. So I know people are watching. What do you think might surprise your fans out there about your personal life that they, that they wouldn't know from just watching you sitting there with the headphones on? Well, I have, I know I battled depression in the past, not to the point of suicide, but that side of me is something I've been able to empathize with people and uh, people that are battling it. I've got an actress right now who calls me or texts me every once in a while if she because she's dealing with depression a bad depression but she knows i've beaten it a couple times and i love the fact that she reaches out to me to to reinstate the idea that she should go get through this and i say yeah you're gonna get through this you're gonna be stronger for it and um especially working at the hospital you see a lot of uh uh down stuff you know i have empathy for a lot of people in those positions you know i remember one night when i was working at the hospital we had what they call trauma i was working in the emergency room and somebody's being carted in and and i didn't know this person i don't even know if it was male or female but i just remember i just went off to a place by myself i said a little prayer for that person you know um because it's like that's somebody's father or mother or sister or brother you know sure yeah and it's just something i notice you know and uh I grew up, I, I had a lot of depression, but I think I'm in a better state of mind now, you know, so, and I'm able to help people as far as that goes. That's something I could tell people. Other than your adorable pussy cat. <laughs> he goes back to me. <laughs> Other than your adorable pussy cat, uh, should the fans know that you're single? So you know what? That used to bother me until I did the makeover. Now I don't care. So, I, so ladies who look like Grace Kelly, <laughs> this handsome guy is single. So just just letting you know that you know we can we can have make make all kinds of things happen to there the you magic go. of television. So um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Anytime I watch Rear Window, you got, of course, James Stewart is asleep in the wheelchair. And, yeah, and you know, it's nice and peaceful, but there's like this shadow coming over him. Then uh, Hitchcock's almost dreamlike. Grace Kelly's face is coming closer, coming closer. And then she kisses James Stewart. It doesn't slow motion. And he wakes up. I'm like, that's the best way I could think of to wake up. <laughs> I get goosebumps when I see that, you know, <laughs> it's a great way to wake up, but, but, and, um, and I'm going to plant a seed with you. You said something that I think is an amazing idea. What's I that? think that you should write a book and call it Hitchcock and his boys. Cause so much has been written about Hitchcock and his blonde leading ladies. But if you were to write a book about the films he did with James Stewart and Cary Grant, uh, you should do that. You have a passion for it. You know the information. You know how to rate and write. Mm -hmm. Hey, 
And writing a book, you get it published, gives you lots of gravitas in show business. Then your talk show host and author, the Python. Have you met uh, James Stewart or Cary Grant? Alas and alack, um, I got famous first in the late 70s, but I was famous in New York. Mm -hmm. I wasn't known nationally. And then, I mean, I, I did make a movie, but I, I didn't become a star because of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't get famous again until the early nineties. And by that point, both of them were gone. So those yeah. are, those are two. I never got around to meeting. I will tell you, there is a wonderful, wonderful Alfred Hitchcock interview done by Tom Snyder. Very, very, very early in the tomorrow shows history. Mm -hmm. where it was just two of them in wing back chairs, no audience. And it's an hour of Tom giving him the best interview I've ever seen. Yeah, because uh, there, yeah. there's no applause and there's no playing to an audience. It's it's a, a master interviewer. And Hitchcock seemed to have been really relaxed with it. So you could use a lot of that. I can get I can get that videotape to you. So uh, you're a talented man as we were, we're getting down to the last five minutes of our show. You're a very talented man. Please get better lighting. Ladies, he's really good looking and in good shape. You just can't tell it because he's in the dark. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you a girlfriend here. But, <laughs> but you're a very talented man. And, you know, the, the fact that you work at a hospital so much and still do all these shows means that you have a good work ethic. You and know I what? I uh, got that from my dad. Dad just passed away April 5th, you know, after eight years yes, of, uh, of ALS. But I got a lot of that from my dad. And um, I worked 19 years at our family spring water plant, and uh, which was owned by my father, my grandfather before that. But when I uh, when the business got sold, I, I didn't ask to be a cleaner. You know, it's just something I knew that not a lot of people wanted to do, and I could probably get a job at. You know, but I'm glad I got into the hospital because that's where cleaners actually make some decent money. You know, because uh, cleaners aren't looked at uh, very highly, and they probably should be, especially given the pandemic, what it was. But, but um, and still is, unfortunately. I just did uh, twelve shifts in my last pay period at the hospital, and uh, I always say yes because uh, it says something to them. You know, and uh, who knows? I'll I'll either get a job at the hospital or Toronto. Or I mean, it's like just take a couple trips to Toronto every year and still do the job here because I, I work with some really good people at the hospital here too. And that's important. What is the significance of that ring on your finger but it only goes above the first knuckle? I got this from Lisa Langlois. It's called a moon, mood ring. And she gave them to all of her close friends. The only reason it's on the middle finger here is because it's too loose on the others. And I had it on one of the other fingers and it fell off and I just happened to catch it one day. So I keep it on this one, but it's called a mood ring and it changes different colors. They were very popular in the seventies when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Any jeweler can put a ring guard on it so it'll fit any finger you want. Yeah, but uh, I, I wear this because to me, it's one of the symbols of my friendship with her, you know? Like I said, Lisa's become very, very important friend to me, and uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing her this fall. Well, flex your muscles for her and see what happens. Well, she's coming on my show on my birthday. There you go. Yep. So, uh, yep, it'll be her third time on the show, and her first time on the show since we personally met. She was on twice beforehand, but yeah, that's uh, that's a mood ring, and she, I, she's given them a I remember when she gave it to me and she had, uh, I think there's another couple of people there um, with us at the time too, that uh, she gave them to. And I, I'm honored that she would give one to me, you know? So yeah, I wear it quite proudly. What, besides talking with me today and besides having her on your show, how, what, what special, wonderful thing are you doing to celebrate your 50th birthday? 
Well, she's going to be on. Nancy McLaughlin's going to be on the show. Another one that I'm very much still in touch with from uh, Friday the 13th, part six. Part and aside from this show. Besides the show? Skittles, are you going to celebrate my birthday with me? Skittles is like, we're back to me. We're back to me. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Take yourself out for a fine dinner. Go to a museum. Do something memorable. And well, I'm going to work that day. But so? uh, and then I got two, two, th- actually probably three interviews that night. But you know what? I'll probably go to Boston Pizza because they've got a really nice uh, pasta uh, meal there that I like to get. And normally on my birthday or around Christmas, I go there and I get that with uh, cheese toast and pineapple juice. But they have something there called a jambalaya, which is really nice. And it's, I always try to get it with penne noodles, but it also is done with spaghetti, you know, but, or a type of spaghetti, not straight spaghetti. And it's got, um, what those, uh, sausage pieces in it that are kind of hot sausage i guess they call them but that's in there and you got shrimp in there and it's it's pretty darn good i'll get yeah, jam- jambalaya is a new orleans dish um, oh okay <laughs> you usually, know all ser- of this. usually serve with rice i like rice well, that's good i like well, rice. sir we're at the end of our hour uh-huh so from me to you Happy birthday, number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we get off mic, let's figure out the next tribute show we're going to do together. Yep. And as I always say on my shows, oh, yes, let's plug me a little teeny when he bit. Jeffrey yeah. Mark plays Ella. That's me. I'm Jeffrey Mark. Ella is the wonderful Ella Fitzgerald. Every week, a different show. Ella's singing, and I'm telling you why they're important and interesting and funny and all the backstage stuff, because I was there. So uh, happy, happy birthday, my friend. And to all of you out there, God bless and have a happy. End your show. Absolutely. And Skittles says meow. (laughs) 